New York's 24th Congressional D District will be represented by one of these two men. Republican challenger John Katko will attempt to unseat Democratic incumbent Dan Maffei in Tuesday's election. WCNY and the Post Standard Syracuse.com bring them together tonight to debate the issues of the state's most hotly contested congressional race. This WCNY election 2014 program is made possible by our members. And by AARP, encouraging New Yorkers 50 plus to learn where candidates stand on Medicare, Social Security, and financial security prior to Election Day on November 4th. Information at aarp.org slash ny. And by SOS Plus, providing evening and weekend orthopedic injury care to patients of all ages while eliminating emergency room wait times. SOS Plus, immediate care with no appointment needed. Weekdays 5 till 8.30 p.m. Weekends 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. From the WCNY Broadcast and Education Center in Syracuse, we welcome you to the debate between the candidates for New York's 24th Congressional District. My name is Jim Maroney, and tonight WCNY and the PostStandardSyracuse.com bring you this important opportunity to learn more about the men vying for the congressional seat that represents Onondaga, Cayuga, and Wayne Counties. You are welcome to join the debate as well as you watch it here on WCNY TV. You'll also see it streaming at WCNY.org and Syracuse.com. Share your thoughts and questions via social media. And you can use the Twitter handle, hashtag NY24Debate. A feed of your responses will become a part of this broadcast tonight, and we may utilize questions offered by the public in our debates. Journalists from WCNY and the Post Standard, Syracuse.com, will ask the candidates questions. The first to respond will have 60 seconds to offer thoughts. 60 seconds will then be provided for the other candidate. 30-second rebuttals will follow. And now we introduce the candidates for the 24th Cong Congressional District here in New York. First, John Katko, the Republican candidate. And Representative Dan Maffei, the Democratic incumbent candidate. Now, by a draw earlier in the evening, the first to offer the opening statement will be Representative Dan Maffei. Uh, Jim, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, WCNY, uh, Syracuse.com, and the Post Standard uh, for hosting this debate. I want to thank uh, Marie and Susan and, uh, and uh, my opponent for uh, participating. It's very important that we have a discussion of the issues uh, and uh, compare our records. I was born and raised in central New York, um, the grand, great grandson of an immigrant uh, from Italy. Uh, who came uh, and uh, fought in the World War I to get his citizenship. He became a barber, and his son opened an electroplating plant with his brothers on Burnett Avenue. I worked at that plant during college. I know what it's like to run a small business, to try to raise a middle-class family, uh, to make payroll, to, to try to save money to send your kids to college. And that's why I've dedicated myself to trying to improve the middle class and their status in central New York, because I truly believe if the middle class succeeds, central New York will succeed. I've done this by focusing on the economy and jobs. I went around the district and made sure that I talked to dozens and dozens of business and economic leaders, many of whom have endorsed me, and many of them supported Jim Walsh, so it's a bipartisan group. We've put forth three basic plans. We need to focus on our small businesses. They create most of the jobs. We need to make sure that we have the infrastructure, particularly the transportation infrastructure that we need to succeed. And finally, we need to make sure we have education and training so that workers can get those good jobs. We do have our challenges in central New York, but working together, we can solve them. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Maffei. And next we will hear from Mr. Katka. Good evening, folks, and I wanna thank you for allowing me into your living room this evening. And I wanna thank the Post Standard Syracuse.com and WCNY for holding this debate. It's truly an honor to be with you tonight, folks, and I want to have a discussion over the next hour with my opponent, Mr. Maffei, about the issues. I'm looking very forward to that. Now, I got into this race because of one fundamental thing. I believe that Congress is broken. We have just presided over the least productive Congress in the history of our country, or at least one of the least productive Congresses. And you know what? Both sides are to blame, Republicans and Democrats. Party affiliation means much less to me than getting the job done. And for 20 years as a federal prosecutor, that's what I did. I was faced with insurmountable problems. 
I was faced with very difficult conditions, often at great risk to myself and my family, but I kept my head down and we solved the problems. We made progress. We stopped crime. For example, when I formed the gang task force in 2002, the murder rate went down 40% the first year that the gang task force was in operation. We got real results. In order to get those results, I had to be a leader. And I've been a leader for 20 years. And I think that's what's lacking in Congress right now. And that's what got me off the sidelines and into this race. I believe I can lead, and I want to lead, and I believe we need a change. And I need, we need a fundamental change in the way we do things. And I ask for your support, and I look forward to the discussion uh, we're going to have over the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katko. Right now, we'd like to introduce the people who will be asking the candidates questions. Susan Arbenner is the host of WCNY's The Capitol Press Room. She is WCNY's News and Public Affairs Director. Marie Morelli is the editorial and opinion leader for The Post Standard and Syracuse.com. Marie will ask our debate's first question. Mr. Katko, both of you are on the record opposing any increase in the federal gas tax which hasn't gone up since 1993. Meanwhile, the highway trust fund nearly went broke earlier this year and Congress patched it temporarily. If we can agree the nation's roads and bridges are in terrible shape, the question is, how should we pay for fixing it? If not the gas tax, what alternative mechanism would you support? I absolutely positively believe that we need major improvements in our infrastructure. Anybody that drives the roads of central New York will tell you that. The question is how you do it. I don't think you graft on to infrastructure improvements whole new spending programs like a high-speed rail like Mr. Maffei is, has uh, championed. I think we need to fix what we have first and take care of the roads and bridges and make them safer and better for everyone. One way I look at that is a highway trust fund. It's charged 18 cents for every gallon of gas that uh, for, goes in the National Highway Trust Fund. But what I found out was that a lot of that goes to mass transit. And mass transit doesn't pay into that fund at all. And I think we need to do one of two things. Either separate off mass transit into a separate fund, which they pay for themselves, just like we do for the gas tax, or we, we start having mass transit pay into the fund as well. <coughs> that would be my suggestion. Mr. Maffei? Thank you. I am opposed to the gas tax uh, because uh, increasing it, I think, would, would hit uh, the poor and would hit, like, particularly uh, single people who drive trucks, uh, those kind of small businesses, worse. It's a regressive tax. We need to take uh, infrastructure, I think, right out of this budget and have a capital budget. That's what businesses do. That's what local governments do. Because infrastructure is different. You're not just spending. You're building something. You're building something that's going to be an investment in our future as a country. That's why I'm, I'm for things like higher speed rail, improving our airports, making sure that we have the best port we possibly can uh, in Oswego. Uh, because Central New York is, has a real opportunity to be one of the main conduits for freight and passengers going from east to west. I think that uh, what we have is a, a potential to have an infrastructure bank, a public-private partnership, and this has been endorsed by members of both parties. Theodore Roosevelt, FDR, and Dwight Eisenhower were ambitious, and they worked to rebuild our country, and it paid off. That's what we need to do. Mr. Kako? Thank you. You can't have a steak and lobster dinner when you can only afford a hamburger. And right now, with our budget constraints and the debt that we have in this country, it's hamburger, it's the meat and potatoes, it's getting the roads fixed. To graft onto that a multi-billion dollar program for high-speed rail that will never be solvent is, is a height of financial irresponsibility. So I think we, let's fix the roads first, and then if, we, then if we, our, our economy turns around and we have the extra money, then let's take a look at high-speed rail. But not now, because it'll never be solvent, and it'll be a giant drag on our economy. Mr. Maffei? Um, John says fix the bridges and roads first. Actually, he just said fix the roads. I do think we should fix things first, but we don't even have enough money to do that under his plan. You need to be more ambitious. You need to be able to make investments in our future. Uh, building a road, building a bridge, building a, a high-tech internet system, smart grids, these are things that are going to make the country worth more. Just like our forebearers when they built the Erie Canal. People said, oh, it'll never work. We don't have enough money. We, we, we can't afford it. And what happened? They built it because of some bold people, and it turned out that that's why we have Central New York today. These are investments that pay dividends. We need to be smart about that. And while we're on the topic of infrastructure, uh, I have a follow-up question for both of you. Uh, Mr. Maffei, which Interstate 81 option do you favor? A boulevard, an elevated highway, a tunnel, or some other option? I think that the uh, opportunity provided by the remaking of Route 81 um, in any of those options is, is 
provides us with an opportunity to, to change our city. And so it's very, very important. And it's not a decision that should be made by any one person, uh, certainly not a congressman. Uh, I think that the community needs to get together and find a consensus. I do believe, though, that I have a strong role to play. A lot of the money is going to be federal money, as well it should be. It was, it was the federal government uh, that imposed the highway on us in the first place, changing the landscape of central New York. Now that it's changed, there are people who depend on it, and we need to take them into account. And we also need to take people into account who want to open up our city and rebuild <clears throat> some of those neighborhoods. So my job is to make sure we have the resources to do that and to make sure that the state thinks outside the <coughs> box enough to let us uh, find solutions that may help multiple different groups have what they want. Mr. Katko? Thank you. He didn't answer the question, but I will. I think that the best option is the one that people seem to be coalescing around so long as it's affordable. The, the, the tunnel option with the boulevard option seems to be what people are liking and, and, and going forward. We have to see the price of it. It's a, if it's exorbitantly expensive, we have to look for alternatives. But I think having the tunnel option, the, the short tunnel option downtown, as well as the boulevard option, satisfies all parties' concerns, and that would be the best one moving forward. Two times in a row now, Mr. Maffei has talked about big spending without telling you how he's going to pay for it. <coughs> Mr. Maffei, 30 seconds. Uh, well, the state has already, the state has already uh, more or less ruled out the tunnel. I think that's unfortunate because I think that there could be funding mechanisms, public-private partnerships, which is a way to pay for these things, um, particularly because the private sector would like to invest because there will be a return on these investments. Um, I do think that they should reconsider a tunnel, and there's several different kinds of tunnel options. But as it is, I've been going to a lot of these meetings, and the state's actually has done uh, cost estimates on a tunnel and already ruled that out. Uh, Mr. Katko said in a previous debate that we should count money first and just make sure that it's affordable. Well. According to the state, the tunnel's not affordable. Thank you. Mr. Maffei uh, misapprehends uh, uh, my previous statement. The previous tunnel option, which he refers to, was about a three or four mile tunnel, which would have been prohibitively expensive. The tunnel currently being contemplated is one where they have an associated cost with it, but it would be for about a mile long stretch underneath what would be the, the boulevard option. It would be much less costly than the three or four mile tunnel, and it's something we should explore if it's, if it's affordable. We're going to switch gears now, starting with you, Mr. Katko. Okay. A corporate inversion occurs when a U.S. multinational company renounces its U.S. citizenship by combining with a smaller company in a foreign country. It allows the company to avoid paying substantial U.S. tax. Do you think this is a problem? And if so, what do you propose to do about it? Absolutely. And to you borrow a term from uh, my drug traffic, my drug prosecution days of drug traffickers, it, in, right now, it seems like we're chasing the dragon. A heroin, a, a heroin addict is tr constantly trying to get the next fix, and that's called chasing the dragon. In the United States, we're trying to chase tax dollars as they're going out the door. That's not a healthy way for us to, 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 to be. We need to figure out why these companies are leaving. And let's face it, they're leaving because it's, it, the, we have one of the highest corporate tax rates in the, in the industrialized world. And if we lowered the cor corporate tax rates so small businesses and manufacturers could better compete on the world stage, and close the loopholes so everybody pays their fair share. And the corporate tax lawyer in the boardroom is much less important than the guy working the second shift at the factory. We'd be much better off as a country. And I think we would see a lot of those people coming back. And that's how I think you solve the problem. Mr. Maffei, what do you think about corporate inversions? Well, I think we do need fundamental tax reform. And as part of that tax reform, we would look at our international tax system uh, and uh, find ways to make sure that corporate inversions don't happen. In the meantime, though, we do have to crack down on these companies that do this. And there are ways to do that. For instance, a, a, a company that decides that it's really a Bermuda company, of course, in name only, they shouldn't be able to get government contracts. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to make sure that companies know it's not in their best interest to do this. There's a lot of these tax breaks that end up shipping jobs overseas that we can close and we need to close and we'll save a lot of money if we do that. So I do think that this is a very uh, important problem. It's a disturbing problem. It does point out the need for reform of the tax code. Um, but I would uh, like to also see reform of the tax code that distributes the burden a little bit more fairly so that the very, very wealthy are paying more and the middle class are paying less. 30 seconds to Mr. Katko. That's a different, that's, that's a different issue, personal income tax. I'm talking about businesses, and I think you should too. And I think if we uh, have the suggested reforms that I've, I've suggested, then I would have no problem taking a look at more restrictions on companies who opt to go overseas. But we've got to level the playing field. So when they make that choice to go overseas, then it's, I, I think that uh, we, we would have a much better chance of 
going after them for, for the taxes that they're not paying here. Mr. Maffei, 30 seconds. Well, actually, many uh, small businesses do pay under the personal income tax. So I do think it's relevant to this discussion. Small businesses need to be able to compete with these multinationals that are manipulating the tax code and using all these loopholes in order to get out of paying taxes. That's why I focus on small business tax relief. I've crossed party lines many times to support making permanent uh, provisions that help small businesses, and I'll keep doing that. May I respond briefly? Sure. Uh, small businesses aren't, aren't the only ones, and I agree, small businesses, we have to give them tax relief. But manufacturers here in central New York, I've been at all of major manufacturers here, like Hudamaki and Fulton, for example, they employ hundreds of people. But it's hard for them to compete on the world stage without the leveling of the playing field. So it's not just about small businesses, it's about, it's about manufacturers who, who provide good paying jobs. So it's not just about small business. Dan Maffei? I mean, I, I'd prefer to sort of stay with the format. Yes. Okay. We have our first social media question coming in and it comes from the western part of the 24th congressional district and that question has to do with jobs and the candidates are asked how would jobs be created for wayne county mr catco you first i think it's part of my my seven point uh, jobs plan uh, economic re economic recovery plan that i that i implemented and i urge you to go to johncatco.com johncatcoforcongress.com to check that out in detail but the guts of it are basically a multi-point plan which includes everything from vocational training for kids in high school that may not be going to college to uh, retraining individuals coming back into the workforce to real tax reform to um, uh, re reforming Obamacare to name a few of the things that's what I would do and it's a multi-point plan and I urge you to take a look at it Mr. Maffei well uh, to answer your question I, I think that uh, obviously the agricultural sector is a huge sector for Wayne County, uh, as is the tourist sector. Um, we need to solve the immigration problem, make sure that farmers have the workers they need, not just uh, for them, but also so they can employ more American workers in plants like uh, the Mott's plant and other kinds of food processing plant. We do need to focus on tourism because there's tremendous tourism. That's why I help get money to, uh, to dredge the harbors that a lot of boaters come to. It's a big part of the, the Wayne County's economy. Um, and helping small businesses, and after all, a, small, a farm is a small business, I still think is the best single thing we can do to improve the economy. I'm not saying we don't help large businesses as well, but 60% of job creation is in those small businesses and farms, and that's where I'm focused. I, I want to focus on the entire, entire county, not just one sector, but of course, the agricultural uh, aspect is near and dear to my heart. My wife and I uh, have been going to her father's potato farm for 35 years now. I know the industry inside and out, and I absolutely agree with Mr. Maffei that we have to have immigration reform with respect to seasonal labor help. But that's just one component of the plan. We can't take look, look askance to the fact that there's many manufacturers in, in Wayne County that need help, and there's many more that can be there uh, if, we, if my economic plan is implemented. Mr. Maffei? Uh, I don't disagree with a lot of what John is saying. The trouble is his economic plan is more or less based on my economic plan, which came out at the beginning of uh, my term, well, several months after, after I talked to business leaders throughout the district. So it's not a surprise, and I'm not saying that these are ideas that no one's ever come up with. Uh, the difference is my plan has details, and details are important. His plan is a, a number of bullet points. Um, it's probably one of the reasons why I've been given the Friend of the Farm Bureau Award. Uh, because I have already stood up for farms, making sure that they have what they need, the personnel, making sure that the regulations aren't too strong and that they can do the, the work that they need to do creating our food. And we will have our next question from Marie Morelli. Mr. Maffei, uh, how would you change Social Security in order to ensure it's solvent past 2034? Well, thank you, Marie. That's a, a good question. Social Security is very important. It's a sacred trust. Uh, since Social Security has become a program, we've gone from over 50% of seniors in poverty to almost down to 10%. Uh, we do need to make changes in order to uh, make sure that Social Security will be there for all generations, not just today's seniors or today's near retirees. There's a way to do that. Uh, people pay into Social Security now through their income. Middle class families pay on almost their whole, on whole, mostly their whole income. Let's make sure that the very wealthy have to pay their fair share as well. Right now, a millionaire, uh, somebody, I'm sorry, not a millionaire, somebody who makes over a million dollars a year pays only uh, Social Security on about 10% of that. That doesn't sound fair. We need to make sure that Social Security is there. Again, not just for the current generation of retirees, but for future generations of retirees and for our society so that we make sure that our seniors be able to retire with dignity. Mr. Kekko? 
you can't tax your way out of every problem. That's what got us into this mess in the United States. We need to put together a bipartisan coalition of lawmakers and businessmen and uh, leaders from all over the country and sit down and figure out what's the best way to do it. We have 20 years, a whole generation to do that. And I think we need to do that starting now. Get together, figure out what we can do to make it solvent so 20 years from now when a problem really arises that we're ready for it. And I think we, sh we should take a look at everything from on a bipartisan basis and get it done. But you know, you can't tax to people to death and think that's always a way to solve the problems. And I think that Mr. Maffei does that and I don't think that's helpful for the United States. We're best when we're lean and mean. And uh, I think by sitting together and sitting down together and figuring out how to do that together, we will find the right solution. Mr. Maffei, 30 seconds. Well, you'd have to make over 117,000 a year to see even the smallest uh, change in your social security payments. This is a matter of the middle class um, who benefit from social security and making sure that the very, very wealthy pay their fair share. Um, we could even st structure it so that uh, the middle class didn't, but, but, in, but have the, the the Social Security payments click back in at 200,000, at 300,000, whatever he wants. Uh, the key thing, though, is we have to make changes, and that doesn't mean passing the buck. Uh, what John just did now is he gave you a lot of platitudes, told you how great Social Security is, but he didn't say one specific thing that we would do. In past debates, he's talked about quote unquote structural changes, but he won't tell you what those are. Mr. Kekko? What you just heard from Mr. Maffei was a tax increase for people uh, that are making as much as, uh, as little as 117000 And I say as little because there's a lot of dual income families in the United States of America, including my wife and I. And if you're making that much money, it sounds like a lot until you factor in paying for college and in, in the marriage penalty and how, much, how little you take, away, take home pay for the second wage earner in your family. So I don't consider those people rich. And I don't, I don't think another tax on them, on top of everything that's happening with Obamacare and the other costs in this country, is a good idea. We are, we are, we are a country of doers. And let's sit down and figure it away without having a knee-jerk reaction to raise taxes. If uh, Mr. Katko had a chance, maybe I... Sure. Okay. Um, I just, what I'll say here is, uh, I guess uh, John didn't hear me because uh, I said, well, if you don't like 117, maybe we'll suspend it from 117 to 500,000 and then put it on. That would at least give us some more revenue and do a lot of good. Part of the challenge I have with, with what John is saying is that what he says, and he said this many t places in the Post Standard and the Auburn Citizen, if you're retired now, don't worry. But if you're another generation, a future generation, that's when you have to worry. That's not right. And I think it's cynical. My Parents, they get their Social Security and they care about that, but they care even more that their children and their grandchildren and someday hopefully their great-grandchildren will, will have the benefits of Social Security as well. Mr. Maffei is talking about raising taxes now, period. Not a generation from now. And he's talking about changes now. Tax, tax, tax. It doesn't work. Let's, get, let, let's put our heads together and figure out a way to do it without having to raise taxes. And we can do it. All right, let me, let me get a follow-up in here. A reader sent us a question. Walter Rath asks you, Mr. Katko, at the recent editorial board meeting at the Post Standard, you said you would not support any cuts to Social Security or Medicare for those who are currently retired or near retirement age. So what cuts would you support for all others? And what age group would those cuts apply to? Like I said, we've got a generation to, to, to uh, deal with the cuts. But let me say something first of all. The only person on this stage who's been engaged in significant major cuts to either Social Security or Medicare is Mr. Maffei. And when he voted for Obamacare and he pushed Obamacare, AARP has said over the course of 10 years that the, the slowing the growth of Medicare payments is tantamount to a $700 billion cut in Medicare. Home health care is already, are already experiencing some of those cuts. But I, so I, I'm not for that. For people that are coming into the system, it's going to have to be different. What that means, I don't know yet. We have to sit down and figure it out. We have to sit down in a bipartisan manner, figure out what's the best way to make those cuts and uh, do them. And I don't know if, this, I don't know if it's cuts. I don't, I don't know exactly what, what it is. But the bottom line is Social Security is a sacred trust and Medicare is a sacred trust. And it needs beer for future generations. And we can sit down and do it without raising taxes. I believe that. Uh, I do believe that Social Security and Medicare are very important. Um, John is passing the buck. He's saying that some magical bipartisan group is going to come up with something that somehow doesn't cut benefits and doesn't raise taxes on anybody. It's just not realistic. And it's not leadership. And it's not going to solve our problems. I put forth a real proposal. Um, I'm willing to compromise if we can find other things that work. But we do have to make these changes. Uh, and let me say this. Uh, John is reading off of Republican talking points that have been widely discredited. 
the $700 million that he's talking about was actually put back into the Medicare trust fund. If we were to do what he wants and reverse it, then Medicare would, would, the Medicare trust fund would go broke much, much sooner and people would be facing Medicare cuts, including current beneficiaries. So don't just read the Republican talking points, actually understand the program. We're going to move on. Um, aside from the repeal, uh, Mr. Maffei, of the excise tax on medical devices, what specific changes would you push for in the Affordable Care Act? Well, there's not only specific changes that I will push for, not only specific changes that I will push for, but there's already specific changes I have voted for and crossed party lines to do it. You mentioned the medical device tax. Yes, that's true. And not only have I pushed for that, but I'm uh, the uh, sponsor of a bill to do that and a co-sponsor of a bipartisan bill to do that. But secondly, I, I would uh, work to repeal the so-called health insurance tax. This is the Cadillac tax. It, in, in central New York, it's not a Cadillac, it's a Toyota. And it there certainly shouldn't be there. Um, I would also uh, work to make sure that people could keep their plans, um, that there would be a reasonable transition for businesses. And I would work hard to return some of these cuts to some of our hospitals. Yes, the hospitals will gain a benefit when people are insured. But that could be five to 10 years before you see enough people insured. So there should be a transition period. But let me say this, the Affordable Care Act does need to continue. We just need to make changes in a bipartisan way. What the Republicans have done is continue to try to repeal it over and over and over again. That's not right. What the Democrats have done largely is say, there's nothing wrong with it. And that's not right either. We need a solution that's gonna work for all of us, that's gonna lower costs and make sure that people can uh, get the insurance they need. John Katko. I absolutely re agree with Mr. Maffei that uh, repealing Obamacare, the, re the way the Republicans tried to do in the last Congress was ridiculous. Unless you have an, a, a suitable replacement for it, you have to, you, I think we're down the road where everyone's gonna have basic health insurance coverage. But make no mistake about it, what Mr. Maffei is proposing are fundamental structural changes to a bill he voted for, and he's on record as saying he never even read the whole thing before he voted for it. That is a height of irresponsibility. And if, if he felt this strongly that he needed this many structural changes, I ask one question, why didn't you stand up for it back then? All right, first of all, uh, Mr. Cat, John is just making things up now. I did read the bill. It was not uh, very interesting because it's written in legislative language, but I actually made a point of reading the bill because Tea Partiers were telling me, you don't read the bill. I read the bill. I read the whole bill. Um, and I can tell you that the things that I'm talking about, these taxes, they were pay-fors for various things. They can be replaced by other pay-fors. They're not fundamental to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and finally, um, I did stand up against the device tax. In fact, we got the device tax cut in half from what it was proposed in the U.S. Senate. Uh, so I worked very, very hard for this district even while we were doing this. I also, by the way, worked hard to get a private, I'm sorry, a public option. Uh, that I wasn't, uh, wasn't successful. But I fought very, very hard for the best uh, bill we could possibly have. Mr. Katko. Thank you. The medical device ta tax directly led to job losses in this district. And you know it, and you were told that before you voted for the bill. And you were also told before you voted for the bill that uh, the, the health insurance tax was gonna be a killer for the middle class. And let's face it, Ob the Obamacare legislation is the largest single tax imposed on the middle class in the history of this country. And you didn't stand up for the people. You just went along with your party. And I would've stood up for them because you know, my, my job is far less important as a congressman than your job. We're going to move on. Uh, Mr. Kako, I'm going to switch gears to foreign policy now. According to the AP GFK poll, 65% of Americans now say the threat from the Islamic State is very or extremely important. And nearly half think the U.S. military response in Iraq and Syria has not gone far enough. Do you agree or not? And if you do, what action should the U.S. government take next? I 100% agree that the threat to ISIS is real and we have to fight them before they come to our, our, our soil. That's our job as a country, that's our job as leaders. And those are tough decisions. But let's face it, we're a war-weary nation. We've been in the Middle East fighting wars for a long time. And I think that based on that, and based on uh, uh, the current situation, I think we have to do what we're doing right now. It was a bipartisan bill sponsored by uh, President Obama that had support from both sides of the aisle, and Mr. Maffei voted against it. And I, it's providing air support, and it's arming the rebels there. Listen, it's not a perfect solution to arm the rebels, because yes, down the road, they may end up turning on us, but we don't have much of a choice, because the only other alternative is to put our, our troops on the ground there. And I have a son in college who's, who's, two, who's two years away from being in the military, 
And I, you know, not just because of him, but because of the hundreds of thousands of people like him, I think it should be a last resort. But what we're doing now is the right approach. If it doesn't work, we have to listen to our leaders and keep all options on the table. But I hope to God we don't have to send troops over there. Mr. Maffei? It's true. I broke with the president on this uh, particular issue. I don't believe that uh, sending in advisors uh, and training uh, and arming the so-called Syrian moderates, if we can find them, makes sense for two reasons. One, those weapons may very well end up being used against our people. And two, it, the, the, the advisors are boots on the ground. Yes, we need to stop ISIL, but we can do that without getting involved in another ground war in Iraq. And that is my central thing. Unfortunately, John, John's position on this is like a Dickens novel. It's war and peace. He wants to have it both ways. He says, well, we shouldn't send troops unless we should send troops. He says that we, uh, he's, the president has handled this poorly and Dan Maffei should have stood up to him. And then when I voted the other way, he says, no, Dan Maffei should have supported the president. You can't have it both ways. This is very serious. I'm on the Armed Services Committee and I work hard every day in a bipartisan way to make sure that our troops get our very best. But we've asked our military families to do enough. And it's time to keep them home and ask, people, ask those countries in the region to do their part. Mr. Katko? So that answer is exactly why I'm running for Congress, because he didn't tell you what his plan would be. He just told you what he didn't want. And meanwhile, ISIS is beheading American citizens and, and, and putting that on the Internet on TV and, and taunting us. We cannot afford to have anything other than a unified response. So that's my plan, and that's what I'm sticking to. Mr. Maffei? I've been very specific about uh, what I would do. I would certainly aid the Kurds. I would make sure we cut off the oil trade that is funding ISIL. I would do uh, specific counter-terrorism uh, operations, like the one that got Osama bin Laden, targeting uh, uh, bombing strikes, if it makes sense, on a humanitarian basis. And I would build a coalition and make the coalition actually provide the ground troops. Right now, we have allies, but they don't seem to want to reply. I've, I've brought this up a couple of times. It's a specific proposal. What we can't do is what John wants to do and react to something on the news and play right into the terrorist hands. Switching gears again, this is for Mr. Maffei. What is your position on the EPA's new power plant rules around carbon limits? If you support them, why? And if you don't, would you roll them, would you vote to roll them back? Carbon is a gas that is increasing global warming and global climate change. We've seen it here in central New York. Uh, unseasonably warm weather, bigger storms. Uh, we've seen it all across the country, Hurricane Sandy, et cetera. Um, this is an issue, and, it's, and it is a, a problem. Um, the EPA has been given by the Supreme Court, which is majority Republicans appointees, uh, the authority to do this because they say carbon is a pollutant. I think that's right. Now, I think we, should, we can do things that make sure that uh, there won't be a, a, as big a burden on consumers. And I'll tell you, most of these power plants don't affect central New York. Why? Because we get most of our power from hydroelectric. I'm going to be in Auburn tomorrow opening up another hydroelectric uh, project uh, from nuclear and uh, from uh, um, natural gas. So, yes, I do think that it's important that we do take steps uh, to reduce carbon emissions. Mr. Katko. That comes at a cost, carbon, uh, the, the regulations, and it makes us less competitive on the world stage. I absolutely positively agree with Mr. Maffei that a uh, contributing factor to the global climate change is the carbon emissions. But when we go it alone, it's a disincentive for the other countries around the world to get on board that are the, that are the major polluters. We have the Clean Water Act, we have the Clean Air Act, which already has, uh, pr produces a great amount of restrictions on our businesses. And now we're grafting on top of that more restrictions. So what's the end game for that? It costs, our products cost more and it costs more to do business here. So what do businesses do? They go overseas. If we had a better leader at the top, I'd be more confident in trying to get a global solution to uh, this crisis. And that is getting real polluters like China, India, and Russia on board on a global solution. I think that's the way to go because that way they'd have a real incentive for change. 30 seconds for Mr. Maffei. Uh, unfortunately, we can't wait uh, for the next president. Um, this is a serious problem. And uh, every year that we 
do nothing, uh, we, we're going to make it worse. Um, so we need to work for global solutions now. I certainly agree with that. Uh, but doing nothing, saying that the United States should uh, simply uh, do nothing because it might cost us, I mean, then, then by that logic, maybe we shouldn't have a Clean Water Act or a Clean Air Act. But of course we should, because air and water are important. Uh, and our land is important, and it's important right here in central New York. The Finger Lakes, the clean wa uh, water we have is attracting businesses, and the clean land, it's tremendous boon. That's why we have all this farming going on today. So I do think the environment is important because the environment is important to our economy, and we reap more benefits from making sure we have clean air and clean water than we do if we don't. 30 seconds for Mr. Katko. Of course we do, but the bottom line is that the major polluters in the world are outside of the United States. China, as you can see, there's days when you can't even see 100 yards in China. They have real problems. India has real problems, and they're the major polluters in this world. We contribute a considerable amount, and we're much better at it than those countries. Let's work together, together. And I'm not suggesting doing nothing. I'm suggesting right now, let's start pushing for a global solution. I think China's ripe for the picking with this because they have terrible pollution problems, and they know they need to get their act together. You are invited to join our debates by heading to Twitter and using the hashtag NY24Debates. We have a question from the social media feed, and it is, what are your plans to improve health care for veterans? And we'll begin with Mr. Ketka. Well, it's part of a larger plan with me with veterans. I have been going, I've been working with veterans groups, and in fact, the Veterans Party endorsed me after comparing my plans and Mr. Maffei's, and I, that's a great honor to me. And I, I, my, there's many people in my family, including my brother, my father, that are veterans, and my grandfather, and I'm very proud of all of them. The bottom line is we don't do enough for veterans. We ask them also to be willing to take, make the ultimate sacrifice for their country, and then they come back home, and, they, and, and uh, they don't always get the care that they need. And the VA crisis is a good example. If you go to my website, you'll see I have a five-star vow for veterans, and it includes everything from having a veteran on my staff from the very first day that I go into office to handle strictly veterans' affairs and be an advocate for them to making sure my job in Congress is, a, is a, as a watchdog over veterans committees. I also want to pair with Syracuse University who has a wonderful veterans program that they're starting. And they're becoming a national leader in that. And I want to be able to get them funding so we can continue not only to provide good health care for veterans, but also to provide good um, uh, outpatient treatment and follow up when they, when, for veterans that are released from the military. Mr. Maffei. Well, to actually answer, I'm going to answer your question. I, I didn't, I heard a lot of good things about veterans. I certainly agree with them uh, that John said, but nothing, no specifics. Um, obviously, the veterans health care system is, is under extreme stress. We are very fortunate here in central New York uh, that we have the VA we do, and thanks to local leadership, uh, that continues. Uh, but too many veterans in this country are not getting the care they need and not getting it soon enough. Part of it is an unfunded mandate, essentially. They're told, the, the VA is told, you have to follow this care by a certain time, and so then they, they fake the records. It's not an excuse. They, they need to stop doing that. But we also need to be realistic about what we're, we're telling them they can do. I've already supported a bipartisan proposal that is the law now that would allow veterans to go out of the VA if the wait is more than two weeks. Uh, that's extremely important. I've supported provisions to let the new secretary of the VA make sure that he can uh, change this system uh, to make sure that it works. But ultimately, we're going to have to decide whether we want to provide what we're promising to our veterans. And it is going to cost money, but there's a way to avoid that, and that is to stop getting ourselves in so many wars abroad without really considering the cost of those wars. Uh, that's the problem with the Iraq War. And it's very, very important that we understand that when we get into these wars, we're going to, produce, we're going to have a lot of veterans, and we owe them a lot more than we're giving them now. Rebuttal, Mr. Katko? Oh, I'm good, thanks. And Mr. Buffet? Fine. We'll move on. Now I have some questions about your political and party ideology, and we'll start with Mr. Maffei. Uh, in your first term, you voted with your party 96% of the time, and in your second term, you tacked away from your party voting with Democrats 79% of the time. Did you become more moderate, or are you becoming more politically pragmatic? Okay, I, I don't I don't look at the statistics uh, because they're very, they're very misleading. I mean, you have uh, all sorts of procedural votes, et cetera. Um, but the general trend is 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 right. Um, I'm uh, actually one of the top ten Democrats uh, that does cross the aisle and vote with Republicans. Um, but it's not because I'm looking to be in that category. It's because on particular issues, I'm looking to represent central New York. Uh, so whatever those issues are, I'm going to try to find the compromise that best suits central New York. Um, on certain social issues, uh, central New York is progressive. Uh, um, 
you know, we don't want the government uh, to involve itself in women's health care, for instance. On tax issues, we're a little more conservative. So I will cross party lines to do that. But the other thing is, I want to get things done. And when the Democrats were in the majority, the Democrats controlled the floor and they made the proposals. And so if the choice was between a proposal that wasn't perfect or doing nothing, I chose the proposal that wasn't perfect. Now the Republicans are in charge. Their proposals might not be perfect or doing nothing. But I'm going to choose the one that's not perfect as long as it's good enough because we need to make progress and not just say no. Mr. Kekko, let me ask you the qu a, a similar question, and then you both will have an opportunity to rebut. Sure. This is a question emailed to us from Harold Matson in Syracuse. Uh, four years ago, Anne Marie Burkle campaign is a mod more moderate than she turned out to be once in office. In order to make sure that doesn't happen again, what would you say are the most prominent differences in policy between you and Ms. Burkle? In particular, would you be as energetic as she was in opposition to a woman's right to abortion? I will, I will represent the country, and I'm not going to uh, try and dis dis differentiate myself from Anne Marie Burkle. She's a fine woman, and I, I, I admire her courage and conviction for what she, what she believed in. I have different opinions on things. I consider myself a moderate, and I consider myself ability to work with both sides, and that's what I'll be in Congress. Now, Mr. Maffei talks about you know, being productive and being, measured, and being measured for his work in Congress. Here's a fact for you. This is a fact. In two terms in Congress, four of the last six years, he introduced 25 bills. Not one of those bills made it out of committee. Not one of those bills got passed, except a highly technical language change to a credit card amendment act. Not one bill for Central New York was passed. Not one. If he's saying he's working across the aisle and doing it on a bipartisan effort, it's not working. Because not only is he, his bills not getting out of, out of committee, he doesn't even have any uh, support from his own party in the vast majority of his bills. There's 435 members in the House, and he has several bills that have no co-sponsors. His medical device tax repeal had just a handful of Democrats signed on. That's not reaching across the aisle, it's not being productive. And I juxtapose that with another congressman who's a freshman congressman, Democrat Sean Maloney. He had two bills passed this, this term, first year in Congress. That's being productive. Mr. Maffei, 30 seconds. I don't think any of us would dispute that Congressman Walsh was a very effective congressman. He didn't have a bill passed with his name on it until the fourth year. It's not about taking credit. It's about working with others to get language and, and provisions that are important to your district in bills. I've gotten provisions in the Armed Services Bill that's not only gotten passed, but has become law. These provisions have helped keep jobs at Lockheed Martin, have helped create new jobs at Saab Census, and have made sure that our troops are better prepared and have uh, the, the equipment that they want and need, including the A-10. That's very, very important. Um, that's what we do. We make sure that we pass the things that matter in bills. We don't need the credit. If I respond briefly, he's using one of those bills that he presented in Congress as, as, as a basis for one of his commercials. So that's why it matters, okay? The bottom line is he's been completely unproductive. And when he talks about Mr. Walsh, the very first time Mr. Walsh's party was in, was in uh, the majority in Congress, he got bills passed. The very first time Dan Maffei was in office, he had a majority. He had the President, the House, and the Senate and got nothing done. He's 0 for 25. And that's part of the matrix you've got to figure out about productivity and leadership when you make your decision on November 4th. I have um, some back-to-back -back questions that I want to ask each of you, and we're going to begin with Mr. Katko. You received over $15,000 of your campaign money from Paul Ryan's PAC or people who support Paul Ryan. So why can't we expect you to support his 2015 budget if you're elected? Well, I'm telling you right now that if Paul, Rudge, Paul Ryan presented a budget to me that it's, that's in its current iteration, I wouldn't vote for it. And if I vote for it in two years, throw me out. If you want to talk about money and special interest and where it's coming from, you need to take a look at Mr. Maffei. Over 80% of my donors are from Syracuse and Central New York. 82% of Mr. Maffei's money, at least 82%, is from outside the district from special interest. That is a stunning figure. I'm beholden to the people of Central New York. I'm not beholden to special interests. Let's say you win. The Ryan budget includes a variety of things, from cuts to Head Start to increases in military spending. It may be presented to you in an omnibus bill. Which key issues will decide whether you vote for it in an up or down vote? Okay. Key issues. All right. Is it good for Central New York? Key issues. Is it, uh, are they going to cut Social Security or Medicare? Because if they do, I'm not voting for it. Those are the key issues to me. And key issues are about national security. All those things are going to factor in. 
But I'm going to have the courage to stand up to it because, you know, I've had a career outside of government, unlike Mr. Maffei, for, for, for 23 years, 26 years. And, I, you know, I, I'm not going to be so worried about whether or not I get my, my party mad at me. Because if I'm there one term or ten terms, doesn't matter to me. It's about standing up for central New York. And I can tell you one thing. I would not have voted for Obamacare, and that's an example. Over to Dan Maffei. For someone who says he dislikes raising money, you are a champion fundraiser with a large advantage over your opponent. And as he says, over 80 percent of your contributions are coming from outside the district. What are these people getting for their money? I believe that we need campaign finance reform. I don't like to raise money, but uh, what we need to do is change the system. First of all, uh, Susan, I do have to disagree with you. Uh, because of the outside groups, and this is the way that John can kind of uh, massage the truth, we'll say, um, he doesn't count any of the outside groups. Two million dollars, <laughs> far more than any Democratic outside group uh, are, that's spending on this race. The way to get rid of money is to sponsor fundamental campaign finance reform. It doesn't have to be paid by the taxpayers. It can be paid by a, a tax on lobbyists, a, a registered lobbyist, and it will sm match small contributions. The other thing we need is a constitutional amendment that says that these special interest groups and parties that come in and buy ads, that that is not the same thing as the free speech that you have on the corner, and that those ads should be regulated. You do that, this, this problem will go away. I don't think that any of us should spend uh, time raising money. Um, I do have many, many more smaller co contributors than Mr. Katko does, about 3,500, and my average donation is about $200 as opposed to his 1,000. But frankly, I don't like it either way, and I think we need to change the system. I have a follow-up for you as well. Um, according to the Sunlight Foundation, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association is one of your largest uh, is one of the largest spenders against the FCC's ability to regulate broadband. It's also called Title II. That group is supporting you with campaign money. Are you with them in your opposition to Title II? Uh, I uh, have a lot of uh, positions that are opposed to their position. I've uh, even done uh, press conferences pressuring uh, these companies to do broadband. I'm not aware of uh, those statistics that you mentioned, um, and I don't have a particular position on Title II, so um, it's a very technical thing, and I simply don't have a position on it. It would just um, basically but I, but be... But I will say this. Well, I'll say this, Susan. Uh, frankly, I, I, I do take issue with the implication. Um, I do have a lot of contributors. Uh, I'm not... I have contributors who have disagreed with each other on various issues. Um, it doesn't affect my votes. It won't affect my positions. Uh, it's a necessity of the system, and I'm for changing the system. May, May I respond others? briefly? Uh, Mr. Katko, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, he really didn't answer the question about uh, his money and who he'd be beholden to. Two and a half million dollars he's raised. Of that, more than two million dollars has come from outside this district. Two million dollars. That's from outside this district. Think about that. And that's more than 80% of his money. I haven't even raised a third of that. And the vast majority of my money is from inside the district. So you know where his priorities are. They're down in Washington, because he is a Washington insider. He is D.C. Mr. Buffet? I mean, again, you know, $2 million of outside money has come in to support John Katko's campaign, including the first negative ad of the race, it's all from Washington. He just came from a rally with four Republicans from other parts of the country, two of them Tea Partiers. Do not believe this sob story of, oh, all my money is local. The fact is, is that Mr. Katko is running a campaign from Washington. He criticized me for having a campaign manager from somewhere else. Then he hired a campaign <clears throat> manager from someone else because the National Republican Party told him to. All right, we will take one more question from social media. And it is in regards to education loans. What are your plans for relieving student loan debt that is choking our district? Mr. Katko. Thank you. I think uh, student loan debt is one of the uh, bubbling crises in this country. It, it, we're getting close to a trillion dollars in student loan debt. And I want to know why, when I go to Congress, why individuals paying student loans are paying three or four percentage points higher than an individual who goes to buy a house and gets a mortgage. Why is that, and where is that money going? It seems to me that since uh, they made the changes over the last few years in student loan debt, that it's gotten more expensive, and it is a crisis. And I think we need to look together on a bipartisan basis to fix it. One thing we need to do, I think, is to incentivize employers 
to help with student loan debt. In, in other words, maybe pay the employee less and give them uh, and, get, and help take on debt. And I think government should have uh, government service loan forgiveness programs as well. Mr. McVeigh. Well, we, we have a program called Pay As You Earn that I would like to expand. It's a very important program uh, that I supported, but it, it doesn't change the, num the amount of loans. It just allows people more time. We need to reduce these loans. Expanding Pell Grants, that's a good way to do it. Making sure we work with our universities to lower tuition and provide them the research funding they need so they don't have to depend on tuition for research funding. I've also uh, sponsored the Work Opportunity Tax Credit, making that permanent across uh, party lines to do that. And I also was one of only three Democrats to cross party lines to make sure that student loan rates didn't double. This is a very big priority for me. I believe that if people can get an education, whether it's college or uh, some other post-secondary school training programs, that's, that's their ticket. Uh, and it's very, very important that we don't continue to start our young people with so much debt, essentially a mortgage but no house. And that's why I've spent a lot of time working on this, doing some of the things that Mr. Katko suggests. I've already been doing them. Gentlemen, we have time for just one more quick response to a question, Marie That's Morelli. That's Almost done. <laughs> My gosh. I told you it was going to go wow, fast. Wow, that went fast. <laughs> go ahead, Marie. And this is for Mr. Maffei. Uh, and I'll ask, I'll ask both of you, but Mr. Maffei, Mr. Maffei first. Uh, what book has informed your political philosophy? What book has informed my political philosophy? Um, I read a lot of biographies. Um, so I would say uh, probably the book Truman by David McAuliffe. Uh, Truman um, was a person who was self-educated. Uh, and uh, he became president at a very, very challenging time, um, right after Roosevelt. Uh, but he all, never forgot where he came from. Uh, and he was always dedicated to the working person, uh, to the middle class, to the farmer, to the worker. Um, and so his life is, is one of my inspirations and one of the things that I uh, work hard to emulate. So that's the book I would say. Mr. Kako? Very simple. It's a book called Tip and the Gipper by Chris Matthews. And I encourage all of you to get it. It's a book about bipartisanship. It's about a guy named Ronald Reagan who came into office considered to be a uh, kind of a right-wing radical in that he was a fiscal conservative. And you have Tip O'Neill on the other side of the fence we had to deal with on a regular basis, who was a hardcore liberal from Boston, Boston Massachusetts. And for six years, they changed the dynamic in Congress. They made the country feel good about themselves again. And they got a lot done. And they worked, did, did it together. They fought, but they respected each other. And they got things done. And you know what? I respect that kind of uh, progress. And I have faith that we can get back to that. And that book is very inspiring. Tip and the Gipper by Chris Matthews. I highly recommend it. Gentlemen, thank you for your responses this evening. And that brings it close to the debate. We're going to end with closing comments from our candidates. And we will begin with John Katko. I'd like to thank you for this time tonight and invite me into your living rooms. You're at, our country's at a critical juncture. And whether we're going to have more of the same, or more of the inactivity, and more of the empty promises, and more inactivity uh, in, in, our, in our economic development here in central New York, or are we going to take a new path? I submit to you that I'm ready to present to you a new path. I have 20 years of being a proven leader as a law enforcement officer in El Paso, Texas, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and here in Syracuse, New York, under very dangerous conditions. I've completely and totally been uh, 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 performed, and I ask, you, I ask you to take that into consideration. Three attorney generals of the United States of America awarded me the highest honor you can have as a federal prosecutor for my leadership skills. The last one was four weeks ago by Democratic Attorney General Eric Holder. And I'm very proud of that recognition, but more importantly, I'm proud of what it represents, leadership. I'm a leader. I've been being a leader for 20 years, and I want to be your leader for the next two years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katko. Closing comments from Representative Dan Maffei. I do want to thank WCNY and Syracuse.com, the Post Standard, uh, for this debate. I do think it's very important that uh, we have a debate of the issues. Um, and clearly, the, the, we two candidates have many differences. Actually, it's interesting, on a lot of the things we're saying, uh, there aren't that many differences. Uh, but if you look underneath, what you see is a lot of platitudes on the one hand with John. He's got some great quotes, some great sound bites. He's read his talking points well. And on my side, you've got a lot of detail, a lot of work already done. Uh, you can log on to my website at maffeyforcongress.com if you want to see a complete list of the things that we've already done for Central New York. Now, I I'm not, I'm not going to pretend that there aren't a lot of challenges that we face. Um, we have to make sure that the middle class is able to succeed. Um, the fact that uh, our, our unemployment rate has dropped from 9.3% to 5.7% doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, we have so many people who are still looking for jobs, and that's why I have two job fairs. At the end of the day, I really, really care about 
the future generations, and not just the current generation. Central New York is the best place in the world to live and work and raise a family. If we want to keep it that way, we're going to have to work together. We're going to have to make sure that all of our citizens get a fair shot and a fair shake. Some of the best things about being a congressman are when I help one individual at a time, when I help them get Medicare pay, or when I help them get Social Security, or when I got one gentleman, a World War II vet, a Purple Heart after 70 years. Those are the things that keep me going, and those are the things that I want to continue to do as your congressman. We would like to thank both of our candidates tonight for their time during the debate and the campaign. And we want to thank everyone for watching this evening. If you'd like to see the program, head to WCNY.org and Syracuse.com to learn more. We will also have an opportunity for you to measure yourself against the candidates and where you stand on the issues. Learn more in the days ahead at WCNY.org. Thank you, Susan Arvetter, Marie Morelli. And for all of us here at WCNY and the Post Standard, Syracuse.com, I'm Jim Maroney. Good night. and by AARP, encouraging New Yorkers 50 plus to learn where candidates stand on Medicare, Social Security, and financial security prior to Election Day on November 4th. Information at aarp.org ny. And by SOS Plus, providing evening and weekend orthopedic injury care to patients of all ages while eliminating emergency room wait times. SOS Plus, immediate care with no appointment needed. Weekdays 5 till 8.30 p.m., weekends 10 a.m. till 2 p.m.